Um, my name is Alex Pavlak. I'm the program director for the uh, Chesapeake chapter. I want to thank you all for uh, taking the time out of your schedules to uh, come to our lecture tonight. I particularly want to thank the Johns Hopkins uh, Applied Physics Laboratory for providing us with the facilities. Uh, tonight's speaker is uh, Gundars Oswalds. Uh, Gundars is uh, going to be talking about the role of systems engineering in uh, large-scale agile development teams. Uh, May has been a agile development month here at the uh, Chesapeake chapter. We had a, uh, a, lecture, a uh, workshop a couple of weeks ago, uh, Suzette Johnson on the uh, uh, on uh, teamwork, and Gundars is a uh, a uh, compatible component to that or a complementary component to that where uh, he will be talking to us more about the practical aspects of, uh, of actually running large teams. Uh, Gundars is a uh, uh, former employee of pra Praxis, is now uh, employed by PCT. Uh, he's a longtime member of, uh, uh, of Encozy. The uh, talk you're going to see was uh, given at the uh, uh, SEDC conference a month ago in uh, in Virginia. Uh, it uh, uh, a <clears throat> his team will be presenting a uh, presenting a, a, a this paper at the uh, uh, the IS conference in uh, uh, Las Vegas, and I believe it's been accepted for publication as well. Correct. Um, Ah, yes, Insight Magazine is, uh, is where you're going to see it. Without further ado, then, let me uh, introduce uh, Gundars, and uh, uh, let's, uh, let's get started. Well, I have another have microphone. OK. okay. Thank you. Um, I will discuss the details on the paper uh, toward the end, but uh, right now we want to get right into the presentation. Um, what we we're, um, we we joined a couple of us joined this uh, uh, agile system engineering working group in the IW in Jacksonville uh, last year, and um, and the board of directors had said, well, we want you to help figure out how agile fits in with system engineering, and so it was sort of an open um, request. And uh, we worked on it for a while, and uh, for months on end, trying to figure out, you know, we wrote up a whole bunch of text and, and ideas. And so we finally uh, finalized on this uh, vision that what we're looking at is, what's the role of system engineering with agile teams, you know, in, in a large system now? Uh, and as I'll talk later on, you know, in the small agile team, you know, the system engineer is maybe also the, the, the coder or the, or the, uh, the project manager or something like that. But a large system, you've got you've to be careful because it can get away from you. So, um, you know, traditional system engineering provides value. And what we were trying to figure out is how we could provide value in an agile environment. Uh, especially with larger systems, you know, like I said, the small systems, which are sort of defined in the um, in the book that we talk that uh, we're giving out. Uh, the books uh, is where <clears throat> where the agile concept started it's about 12 some years ago, and that was the uh, agile manifesto. And the reason that uh, the book is interesting is because you know the agile manifesto, the rules and regulations, and all the training that we see today is from that experiences that they had in that book. Now, the experiences that they had in the book was a team of 10 people doing their thing, you know. And so we've got a little bit different problem here. And, uh, but it's good to know that. And so that then you can say, well, <clears throat> maybe, maybe their experience is for them. But for me, uh, I need to do something a little different. So that's why I thought that was a good reference document. There is no book right now on system engineering uh, and with an agile environment, so I guess if somebody needs to start writing a book. Now here's the thing, how do we join the party? 
you know, we're the system engineers. The software people are sitting over there in the corner, having fun, you know, laughing about our requirements. Uh, and we can't really affect them because, you know, we're not, we're not in that click. You know, we don't understand software. You know, I mean, we don't understand what, how they're doing it. You know, the agile process is so completely foreign to us. You know, we're used to the waterfall process. So we, so basically the thing is, how can we join the party? Now there's been a study, and I'll show you the uh, a recent study that says that uh, <clears throat> agile benefits maybe provide you less cost, less time to market, and better quality. <clears throat> One of the things I keep hearing, hearing, hearing all the time is that agile is fast. Well, agile has nothing to do with fast. It's not a, it's not a concept in, in the agile. The concept is I, I could maybe make it faster if I close the loop in terms of uh, the customer being on, you know, in the, in the, in the loop to, to give me feedback. Um, and it may be faster because the customer could say, you know, let's say at the beginning of the project, we have 100 requirements. And the customer says, well, we really don't need 20 of them. Now, currently, you got to do all the 100 or you're not going to meet the contract. But you could be a little bit more agile by saying, well, we only need 80 of them, and you can get the work done a little faster. So there's sort of a feedback loop. You know, as we know, that system engineering is very much a, a process, and there's nothing wrong with it. Uh, I think that that's still needed. Uh, <clears throat> you know, the other thing is that the first time I took a agile lesson and course, I think uh, Suzette was actually the one that... Uh, introduced me to that. And I come out of the presentation, I say, well, darn, Agile is much more structured than anything I've ever done before in software development. You know, it, it's, got, it's got these rules, it's got, uh, you know, sort of uh, points of re re reviews, and it's got feedback loops, and, and it's got uh, customer involved. <clears throat> so there's a lot more in Agile, I mean, it sounds like you can do anything you want, but it's not true. And so what we'd like to do is we'd like to expand it to larger programs. Now, this is what we run into. You know, there's really two types of uh, programs. You know, one is, one is the one we typically do is we got a contract, we got 100 requirements, and, and if we satisfy those requirements, we get the money. But unfortunately, we can satisfy the requirements, and the customer might, might not be satisfied. Uh, the other type of project is where you sort of get brainstorming, and you know, it's sort of like a startup, and you sort of do it iteratively. And there's really the requirement is we got to do something cool, <laughs> and and you end up with with some some value to the project, and and that would be something where you're developing a new product or new pro new gadget or a new widget. Uh, but you know we're we're going to look at what we've got to do in our environment where we're basically we got a set of requirements and we have to do it. You know the interesting thing is you know we have these five year programs and the customer doesn't like it, but he told us exactly what he wanted. What's going on here? Well, some of the requirements aren't met because you know maybe the requirements the technology wouldn't allow it. The requirements are incorrect. I mean, the customer stated what he thought, but uh, but he actually misstated. You know, it wasn't his fault, it wasn't your fault, but the system gets delivered with incorrect capabilities. And of course, what happens, you know, in a five-year program or even a year program is things change, and the contract says you got to do these requirements, and I don't care if things change. I don't get paid if I don't do the requirements, if I don't implement them. So that's that's what happens. So what we'd like to do is we'd like to say, could we use Agile software development methodology to involve the customer to help in decisions? Now, as, as I talk a little bit later, is how do you write a contract like that? And how do you say it's done? Now, working with the customer, it's certainly you know, involving them in decisions. But how could we 
how, how can we use it in our environment? And how can we, as system engineers, work with the, the agile methodologies and teams to do that? So um, we're hoping that, you know, like I said, it may provide more value at lower cost. Uh, you know, Agile is just like anything else. You, you've got to work with it. And I think one thing in the Agile world is that the customer's got to be more involved in the day-to-day -day than, than in a program where they only check it every couple months, like, well, what, what's the increment? Where are, you, where are you? We're this way. We're really depending on the customer being more involved. You know, the traditional um, waterfall processes, you know, the final product is not well specified. We we spent five years doing something, and we'd end up with something that we didn't even realize what we got. The customer doesn't, you know, there's just complete disconnect. Now, there's maybe not complete disconnect. I, I might be overstating it, but there's some disconnect, and that's enough to have an uns unsatisfied customer. So what we'd like to do is come up with the idea where we, we come up with a the customer has a vision of the final product and we keep iterating with these sprints and increments until we end up with what what they wanted. Now it doesn't mean that this is going to be, as it's shown here, that it's going to be a smooth path. You know, you're going to try things out, you go make mistakes, you're going to come back, you're going to try it again, you know, uh, nobody's perfect. The, the process is not going to lead you to per perfection, but the fact is that we got the food, food back, feedback loop within, you know, whatever the time of the sprint is, you know, a week, two weeks, four weeks, whatever. Uh, there is a feedback loop, and, and of course, at the end of each sprint, uh, you should be uh, in, a, in a way of developing and, uh, I'm sorry, showing uh, dem demonstrations of the work that you've done. And that's, you know, in the Agile uh, manifesto, that's, that's sort of the rule. Like, every two weeks, you've got to demonstrate something. Every two weeks, you know, you've got to get a compile done, get all the software done, and demonstrate it. Now, I think that uh, that's something that you could look at and say, well, is it really necessary in my environment? Could I maybe do it every month? You know, every two weeks, I'll have a review. But every month, I have a demo. You know, so there's, there's things you can adjust. I know when you go to these training courses, they're like, you know, the, the Agile Manifesto said this, 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 and if you don't do it, you're not Agile. Well, I, and, and in fact, it's not, I'm sorry, it's Agile Scrum. This is a Scrum, you know, the book is about Scrum. So there is some other Agile methodologies, but Scrum is the one that's more, most prevalent. You know, like we said, the waterfall is optimized for no change. You got to change, give me an ECP, give me money, give me this, give me that. And, you know, the thing would be is, how do you define agile-based comp completion? What are the options? You know, you've got your uh, typewriter and your whiteout, but, you know, how is it completed? Uh, so I think, you know, when you work together interactively and try to converge into a problem, uh, you might you, you let the customer define the uh, the uh, the completion, and like I just said earlier, that if you have 100 requirements and and at the beginning, and the customer uh, goes on and and prioritizes those requirements in the first sprint and the second sprint, and these requirements get left at the bottom, it's just like your to-do list at home. <laughs> you never get around to doing some things, no matter they were on the to-do list for to-do list for years, uh, but maybe they're not that important, and so. Do we have to do the 100 requirements? You know, we've got to change the way we're, we're uh, having the completion. Now, what this does is it creates some conflict in the procurement cycle, in the procurement uh, uh, pro process. Uh, now, Suzette has worked on a committee with the government to try to, final, to, to define what maybe a, a, an agile procurement process would look like and where the checks and balances would be but that's still far from being uh, resolved. So I think what we need to do as system engineers, uh, maybe sell our customer on these programs to say, well, you can have the decision when it's done. Um, and, and I think one of the things is, you look at it this way, 
and, and this is one of the interesting things about that Agile team. They said, we have this Agile team, and we keep working forever. And the Agile team, you know, there's these sprints, but they never say that, you know, everybody's left the team, no new people on the team, nobody's got to be trained, nobody's got to be retrained. You know, it's not a real world uh, environment, but um, what we can look at is say, okay, so we, you've got team members, you've got cost and time. And then the other thing is, you know, capabilities. So what gives? If, you, if you've got cost and time, and those are critical, then you may have to drop 20 of those requirements. Now, I know I worked for two years on, on an IRAD, and, uh, you know, I first got this budget, great budget, uh, you know, two, two months later, we're going to cut it 20%. Well, I said, okay, we'll just keep doing it. Oh, th six months later, we're going to cut it 50%. Well, what you do is you just take the top stuff and do it, and, you know, don't get worried about it. You know, there's certain things that you can't do, but you keep, you keep it going. So I think we've got to have a different attitude on how we're going to approach the problem. And, you know, of course, we've got these handoffs with formal specs, formal requirements, formal architecture formal gates, and agreements. Uh, and of course, that's part of the contractual thing too. You know, you've got a contract, and then the contract gives you all this information. But uh, in the Agile methodology, and we'll show you some, some ideas here, we can work, we try to work together, basically become a team, you know, an integrated team with the software people and the testers and and uh, you know other people in the organization, and you know that's nothing new. That's in the uh, Incosi handbook. Integrated teams is like one of the features. You know, there's chapters and chapters on that. It's not you know it's like it's not like the agile people invented anything. You know that was their thing. Like we got six people in the room and they all talk to each other and they all know different stuff. Well, hey, you know it's been in the Incosi handbook for for years. So what we're looking at is. Uh, we're trying to work with the, you know, the user needs need to be traced by the, uh, at least the system engineer should be responsible for the requirements. You know, they get the initial requirements, they should sort of keep track of it and at least keep track of what's being done and what's not being done. If it's not being done, that's fine, you know, in this environment. Um, we have user stories, user needs, uh, you know, we, we present an architecture vision, I'll talk a little bit how we do that, but we we sort of we're responsible for presenting the the, the vision and then helping the uh, the implementation team work together on it. And uh, now the software design you know comes from the software people, but we we might drive the design in a way by telling them uh, what functionality is needed based on the requirements. And you know of course that's our, also our job is to derive requirements to take the customers' needs and derive them down into sort of system capabilities or, or even user stories, which the agile people, people like to work with. Uh, and then what they do is they chop them up into different tasks and then they distribute the tasks. So one of the, like I said, this is nothing really new, but one of the things we're looking at is we've got a planning team, you know, on a program which is, you know, we all do that anyway. Uh, we have the managers, uh, the key key individuals, and then they sort of work with the architecture team, and they say, well, we got this. You know, we got the time, money, requirements, whatever. Uh, you know, and the architecture team sort of puts together uh, some idea. You know, some first initial uh, design, and I'll, we'll show you a process step for that. And then uh, you notice that the system engineer works on the planning team, he, wor he works on the architecture team, he works on the implementation team, and he works on the integration and test team. So what it is is, you know, maybe as a system engineer and an architect, you're really working here most of the time, but you're also forward deployed, forward deployed so to speak, on these other teams, only at the times that they're needed, you know, like the beginning of the scrum, at the end of the scrum, uh, you know, you step in and out. And in fact, if you've got three teams going together, I mean, you know, one person might be able to handle all of them if you, if you overlay the, if you have them at different, uh, you know, 
if they end up different weeks, you know. And then we've got the integration test team, of course, working with everything else. Now, this is just a, a role, set of roles and some ideas. But I think the idea is integrated teams. Um, and, and I think, you know, I think the integrate, system integrator, tester, um, you know, they're all working together. And, and we're not showing the, all the details. Some of these people might be working at the planning. You know, the test team might really should be maybe in a, with the planning team to understand what the testing requirements are and, and so on. So um, how can software, how can we support? Uh, agile software development. Um, you know, there's, you know, I was talking about the, the, the small programs that have been successful, and now how do you integrate large programs? And how do you, how does, you know, let's say you've got a, an architecture slash system engineering team, and you've got 50, let's say, five sets of 10, five, five teams of 10 individuals each. You know, you don't want, want each of these teams to come up with their own architecture. You don't want them to come up with their own vision of the requirements. And so, so it's up to you to sort of herd the, herd the cats. <laughs> you know, that's, that's your responsibility. Um, and like I said, we're, we're, this presentation and the paper is from the perspective of you, the system engineer. So what we're proposing is a framework which is really uh, sort of a combination of, of uh, how the teams work together. And it's, it's not any that much different from, uh, from uh, how a single team would work, but we're trying to show that there's uh, multiple implementation teams working in sort of parallel, you know, and the architecture team comes in, in here they do planning, and the architecture team goes and helps the implementation team. And while they're doing their implementation, they may be doing the, the next iteration, uh, you know, forward-looking design, forward-looking requirements. Uh, and then they get together, you know, at the, at the times. I mean, we really can't show all the details here. We did make a chart to show that, and it's just, just too, too, uh, too difficult to, to do. But we're just trying to say that we, we have these, uh, you know, the, we have these iterations slash scrums that, uh, that we we're keep evolving until we get ready for the final release. But each iteration, and like I said, depending on what, how often you want to do it, you can show demonstrations. And, uh, and I think what, ha what will happen is that the, um, that the owner of the project of the program will become more comfortable with it once they see progress and once they see results. And uh, you know, and that's part of the magic of the agile is that you get uh, the customer comfortable with what you're doing because you're not like every quarter you got this formal review and you don't really know, they're just telling you all these slides of how good they're doing, but you still have worried about exactly what they're achieving. So I think one thing is that the challenge is for the system and engineers to work in agreement with the software people. Otherwise, this is what's going to happen. And this happens all the time. You know, you go to the, to the guys on the corner, on the, in the corner, and they say, can you change this? I, I think this should be done differently. No, go away. We know what we're doing. Well, you know, if you're working with a team, then uh, you, you gain their respect, and you understand what they're doing. You know, I know that uh, you know, I've been away from software development for years, and there's all sorts of cool, neat stuff out there that wasn't around when I was doing it. And like, oh, I didn't even know about it. That's cool. So if you have people, if you give them some uh, ideas and, 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 and work with them, they'll come up with different solutions that then you can help them uh, to, to decide whether, it's, whether it would work on the project or not. So I think that... <clears throat> So, that, so one of the things is we need to integrate our pro, you know, our system engineering processes in sort of an agile way, and that's what we were trying to show on the uh, in the present in the sl slide. So what we're looking at is we're doing some pre-planning, 
uh, you know, before we even start anything, before the coders, you know, we don't want to start coding or developing software. Now, they can be developing their environment and you can do that, but, you know, how long is it going to take to, to sort of get your act together? Uh, you know, that's always a problem because the coders might start coding before you, before you really got a, a design done. But, uh, but we're trying to work together. And then you're, you're just going through the iterations. And, uh, and the system engineer uh, maintains the integrity of the architecture and the requirements. That's their responsibility to sort of make sure that things uh, don't go bad. But on the other hand, they also have to realize that things change. And they have to be able to uh, update the architecture plans. <coughs> Uh, maybe go back to the customer's customer and say, well, we found these things that in terms of performance, in terms of functionality, uh, that should be changed, and, and we really think it's important to change it. And so, so you're sort of a negotiator, too. Now, the, um, the other thing we did, and, and this, more of this is in the paper. Um, this is just a, a sample chart, but we're just sort of listing tasks and who's, let's see, here it is, who's, who's responsible. The responsible one would be the one that's actually sort of leading the task, like the, the, the senior software engineer or developer. Uh, the consultant may be the different uh, software team members, could be a, a database expert, could be a math expert. Um, and then the informed is the people that just Want to want to know about it, you know, like the upper level management. We we don't have that on this chart, but we had it on other charts. Um, and then the accountable is that's the that would be like the product owner and product owner in terms of uh, Scrum terms is the person that's on the on the floor with the team with the, with the implementation team uh, making the decisions for the for the stakeholder whoever that may be. I mean, it may be many stakeholders. It may be the the owner of the project, you know, the one that sends, signs the checks. It may be the uh, the user. It may be the the uh, administrator. Uh, it it may be the, the the deployer, you know, that's deploying the systems. Uh, so uh, so that's that's the product owner, and and that's the one that can make that's been delegated from the from the from the team, you know, to make decisions. And hopefully, uh, you know, we ran into a situation where they wanted to do, do some, they wanted to say, well, we need to have a PDR and a CDR and a RDR and a da, 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 you know, for an Agile team. Like, wait a minute, <laughs> you know, just to have one of those reviews is going to take you two weeks to get people together in one place at one time to make a decision. So, you know, we're arguing like, Leave them alone. You know, you keep you can keep track of them every two weeks, um, and and you can go back. You can go find out what's going on. The other thing, of course, uh, which I like in the agile process, and and I was as a software developer, you kept getting interrupts. The way the agile process is, you start to work for two. You, you, the product owner decides on the priorities. The team member picks the tasks, and then for two weeks they're left alone. There's no drive-by. You know. Uh, and, and what that does is even if they end up at the end maybe not completing something because they, you know, they learn something. And, and so it's, it's, it's a more um, an environment where, where you don't really, you know, you're not blamed for mistakes, but you learn from mistakes. So um, we have software, agile software development methodologies that, you know, offer a fast, lean, and flexible approach. But fast is, you know, not, you know, I, I, like I said before, I didn't really like the word fast, but uh, it's, you know, it, it really is a, it, it really is a flexible approach in terms of sort of guiding yourself to the, to the end stage with, a, with a, you know, sort of an iterative, you know, taking different roads, backing up and going back uh, in, and of course, they're challenging the traditional approaches. Uh, one of the things is you hear like, well, we've got this regular system engineering 
uh, software development process and it's failing, it's failing, it's failing. Well, you know, if they just took a little piece of the Agile thing, saying, well, let's say every two months, let's, let's find out what's wrong and change a direction. But, you know, these days, you know, you, you're, you're, you're not allowed to change a direction because we started out and we're going, going straight down that road no matter what. So I think that's what we want to do is we want to, want to change that. Uh, you know, the cross-functional teams help to work together, and, uh, and we, we don't want, uh, you know, not, you know we don't, we're not asking the software organization or the software members of the team to do system engineering or architecture, just like they're not asking us to do software. But, you know, but if we leave them alone, they're going to end up doing that. So that's why we have to be there. Because they'll do it because it just they don't have any other guidance. And so we have to keep on top of it, we have to be ahead of it, and we have to sort of plan ahead one iteration so that we can, um, we can help them, uh, you know, when they have, when they need needs. And like I said, uh, flexibility absorb changes in mission requirements. One of the, ter what are the, one of the good places for agile scrum method methods is if you don't know what the requirements are. And I think that's maybe a little bit overstating it. It might be that you know, you know a couple of key requirements, uh, but you don't know them all because you, you really haven't gotten there. But you know you've got to do A, B, C, and then you find out you've got D and E later. So the thing is that, that that allows you to add, like I said, with the customer there, allows you to add those, uh, those requirements and make the, make the solution better. And, uh, you know, we keep the customer informed and, and knowledgeable of what's going on. And certainly they feel much more comfortable if you've got some results to show them periodically. So um, just to, as we said before, uh, we, were, uh, we were part of the Agile Software Engineering Working Group. Um, it was in IW in Jacksonville and last year. We had about 20 people sign up for this working group. And you can see four people worked it. <laughs> so, you know, but, uh, but we had about 10 people that actually, uh, and, and we have the acknowledgments in the paper, there's about 10 people that actually reviewed the, reviewed the paper as we went along at different times. And uh, we appreciated that. And so even if you're, uh, you know, can't be at the, every meeting of the working group, it's certainly helpful uh, for the, to review it from a different perspective. And I think, you know, the good news is uh, all four of us were engineers, but we also were working actively in scrum projects. And so we, we knew both sides of it, and that's what uh, helped to help develop the paper. Like I said, we're going to be out in Las Vegas. I, I did the SEDC, and in July issue of Insight, there's a, uh, art, there's a se section, I mean, the, 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 the issue is about agile system engineering and agile software methods, and well, I, I'm sorry, it's agility and system engineering. So it's sort of different areas. You know, the agility and system engineering is how do you develop systems that are agile and doing their mission, and agile system engineering is more like you know developing system products. You know, it's just unfortunate that the word agile is used in in both of those terms. And in fact, in the paper we say. This is not agile engineering. This is agile software development. Um, so my question is, can you align your processes? Can you can you work, you know, within your environment? Can you get things uh, done better? And and I would say, you know, it would be very good. Such as I, you know, I'm a Scrum master. I did tra training, official training and testing. And even though you're not going to be doing the software, you understand their process and their technology techniques. So I think I would encourage everybody here, if you're going to be working in this environment, to take the training, even though you might not be a Scrum Master. Uh, you know, now the Scrum Master, the duties of the Scrum Master is to make sure that the there's the requirements are there, the tools are there, the desks are there. The environment is there, the people are there, you know. 
So that's, uh, that's you know, the Scrum Master doesn't do any technical stuff, uh, but he sort of keeps track of, make sure everything goes. It's like a project manager, so to speak. But anyway, when you take these courses, and like I said, Suzette had one a couple weeks ago, and maybe we can do another one later on uh, if there's more interest in that. Um, I guess uh, we're ready for questions now. How do you see Agile applying to a big place like APL or big project, let's say, like developing a healthcare website? It's a lot more than just software. Well, uh, but but then you know you've got to look at the. Uh, I mean, the team, you know, and I think you know at the um, at the SCDC, I was asked the question, "What about hardware?" You know, and I guess the answer would be is, you have a hardware development team just like you have a software team, and you do the same thing. You know, you you have meetings with them, and, and you say, "Here's the uh, here's a plan for the system, and and we need a we need a widget here and a widget there." You know. And, and here's a need, you know, here's the performance parameters, here's what, what can you do, you know, and, and uh, give them a month or something, you know, the harder guys got to move metal and, and say, well, we're, we're, you know, we're, you know, you can still work in that same environment, you know, it, it's nothing, I don't, I don't see any difference in that. Now, as far as multiple teams, yeah, there, and I think uh, Suzette has some experience when she worked with Northrop Grumman and she's worked with the federal system. In terms of uh, how the how the scrum masters meet together and, and make decisions about the whole program, because if you have 15 teams, you have to do another layer of, of interaction. But the fact is, you want to leave the agile teams alone. You know, you don't want to you, you don't want them to be in all these meetings. You want to sort of organize them and through the system engineering, through the scrum masters, give them uh, you know information that they need. No, I, I, uh, the hardware, it applies just as well to hardware. Um, 17 years ago, I was, I was head of ma uh, air vehicle manufacturing uh, for uh, AAI, and we had a problem with, we had a business unit called ROR, Repair Repairables. The air vehicles would come back from deployment, we'd have to turn them around so they can redeploy. They had a problem. It was taking over 400 days for us to turn around an air vehicle, which was unacceptable. Our goal was, and we achieved it, by turning it around in less than 90 days. And what we did was essentially a scrum. We didn't have the vocabulary then, but that's what it was. Right. We had a board up. We had everybody on the, the factory floor, the factory manager, the, the chief engineers, the expediters, the foremans. And every morning, we would have a stand up. This is what's on the workload today. This is what we said we can do. And we had a little scrum board. Once again, we didn't call it that, but that's essentially what it was, and tracked every piece of hardware as it went through. And every day we would have a stand up. You said you'd have this ready by this day. Is it ready? Yes or no. If it wasn't, we'd drop it off the schedule. And so essentially we were running sprints, but it was purely hardware, 100% right. hardware. But the same is the same exact methodology. So right. it, it applies equally to hardware right. as well as Let me as make another comment about uh, Kanban. That is another process uh, where you have, a, it's basically where you, you have a, a list of things to do, but only, <laughs> this is sort of strange, only one thing per person, <laughs> you know. And so, so you're, you're, you, thr you throttle that at the front, you say, this person is going to work on this task until they finish it, you know, or if they can't finish it, well, then we got to figure it out why it's, what's going on. And so what that does is, it's sort of like, a, they, they sort of say like attendance at a, an amusement park or something where they got a limit of how many people can be there. So it's a limit of how much work, uh, work uh, items that, the, that a team can perform. And I think that's actually, you know, that's used as a board. Uh, and, and that's, you know, we've used that in some system engineering projects. It's a little bit less, uh, less paperwork than, than agile or less, less, meetings, but it's still, you know, a list of things to do, and you still have the, the customer deciding the priorities, and you have each person sort of picking what they can do, what they would like, either what they like to do or what they, they know how to do that, you know, because if you've got a database expert and a, and a, 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 you know, 
this expert and, and this kind of expert, you know, not everybody's going to be able to do everything. And that's one of the problems with the Agile Manifesto is like, well, all these people can do everything, you know, that's not really reality. Uh, you know, it might be reality if you've got seven Java programmers and they can punch all the Java out. But if you've got a database guy and a, and a device driver guy and so something else, well, you know, they're not all can be, can be used. So they're going to have to pick maybe things down further down the list because that's the only thing they, they are qualified for or they feel they're qualified for. But that's, a, that's another uh, concept that's a little bit, uh, a little bit leaner than agile, but it, it, I think more has a place in maybe in system engineering. Um, <clears throat> with the systems that everybody's been talking about that has the software aspect, has a hardware aspect, but if you have multiple teams are uh, de developing different soft parts of the software, but there are dependencies. So how do you deal with dependencies and the fact that maybe one team can complete what it needs to do and another team can't, but there's a dependency between them? Well, I think that's just a standard way that you just have to schedule that or, you know, somebody's going to have to slip a schedule, you know, I mean, in a, in a regular, ta you know, in the, in, the, in the normal system engineering process, they say, we've got to do this first, we've got to do this, we've got to do that. Well, guess what? Half the time, things don't get done in that order because they run into some kind of problem. So I don't see that would be any different. You just sort of, you might just have to say, I finished this and I've got to put it on hold until this other team comes around. I mean, that's just reality. And then they got a list of things to do, that, you know, and then maybe the next um, next increment or next scrum, they'll say, well, let's pick up that stuff and let's integrate it. I mean, I, I think, you see, I think, you know, the thing about the agile process and methodology, it's a little bit overblown about how perfect the, the world, you know, the world is so perfect in that, in that book. You know, that's why when you, when you guys read it, it's not reality. I mean, it's perfect in terms of a process, but then you've got to re realize that not all those people are going to be there all the time. Somebody's going to get sick. Somebody's, somebody's going to be pulled off because they've got to know another project. And so what do you do? You know, you, you miss your deadline. Well, you know, you miss your deadline. I mean, I, I can't do anything about that. You need a microphone. I think that's what Steve's asking and what you just said kind of points up one of the difficulties. I used to kid some agile developer guys that I worked with have some background in construction. So if I had an agile construction crew, we'd all get together on the job site. And the plumber says, well, no matter what kind of house you guys are going to build here, I know you're going to need a couple of bathrooms. So while y'all are talking about the house, I'm going to build a couple of bathrooms on the site. Well, will they hook? Uh, what's your floor level going to be in the bathroom? Where are you going to put them? What's, you've now determined the street setback. If you're building a ship, are you going to pray the Agile team building the rear is going to mate up to the Agile team building the front? Um, I think there are some illusions created by the fact that with software, it's ones and zeros, so the interface and the hook togethers become a lot simpler than if you have an aircraft carrier where the front end of the flight deck is right. 25 right. feet lower than the right. back yeah. end. Of yeah, the deck. And, and, and to interrupt you, you know, that's where the system engineers need to help and need to try to manage that, uh, whether they can manage it well, you know, completely. I mean, it's a hard thing. I mean, projects come and go, but at least you, you should be able to have some processes in place that try to try to tell that you know and that was what we were talking about doing things ahead you know this, the system engineer can do some planning ahead of the of the next delivery scrum while the while the software developers are working so we're trying to do a, a look ahead well, the difficulty i found is that the kind of help we provide in that situation runs exactly counter to the agile idea in other words, the way I can help you is coordinate you, but coordinating you is kind of an anti-agile stance. Well, but I think, I, I, but I, that's what I'm saying. You, 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 you can't tell them exact, but you got to work with them and you got to understand, you know, I think once you understand what they're doing and their problem and how they're approaching the problem, you know, there's got to be some guidance there 
with a team, you know, I mean, an agile team is supposed to be like self, self, uh, you know, self. vision. Yeah, right. So, and and so, if you're a part of that team, you know, you can help that. I, I'm not saying you need to be outside the team, but what you're doing is, you go step outside and you look at it and make sure that what what we think we're doing is going to be consistent with what what the program needs. I'm not saying the program can't be agile, but the program. I mean, even an agile thing, you know, I've got to do A, B, and C. Why are we doing this? And, you know, I've got to get money out of the bank. That's, you know, I mean, there's a couple things up here on the requirements that need to be done, and you can certainly check on them, but you could also not be so prescriptive to say how they're going to do it and what they're going to do. Like I said, I found these uh, software, the new software people, like they got all these tools that I didn't even really know about. Well, let it, don't, don't question it. Let them do it and see what they come up with. Um, I had a question, uh, Gundars. Yeah. Um, I, I guess I was always of the view that some projects are amenable to agile development and others are more appropriate for classical planning. And the big distinction between them is the clarity and stability of the goals of the requirements. With uh, consumer products and with human interfaces, you really don't have a clear idea. You, you can't really specify clear ultimate goals. You got to show the customer what it looks like, and then the customer can decide and change his mind. Whereas if you're building a house or an aircraft carrier, you got a uh, pretty firm set of requirements that allow you to do classical planning that do not does not require a uh, a lot of iteration. Uh, so the view is there are perhaps some projects suitable for classical planning, other projects more suitable for agile development. And I was wondering if you agreed with that or if well, you had a different point of view. Well, I would say maybe some projects are 80% suitable for classic planning, but I would still like to have the 20% agile in there because if you're somebody's building a house for you, you go in there and, and they say, well, we got this problem because the previous, previous uh, uh, construction person did something and we can't fix it because they put a wall in the wrong place, <laughs> you got to be agile to say, well, okay, that's fine. We'll, we'll put the bathroom over here instead of over there. I, I, think, I think you still can use some of that. I think that would help. You know, one of the purposes of agile is to try to deliver to the customer what they need. You know, and, and remember, the va validation, we're only validating that the requirements from the customer were met. We need to, ver I'm sorry, verifying verification is only we need, and validation is like, well, this is really what they want. So I think that still, we need to still keep a 20% in there to make sure that we can fine tune it because they could have given the requirements wrong. We could have implemented them wrong, even in a perfect system. And that's, that's the idea of what you got this five-year plan and five-year program and at the end, well, that's not what I wanted. Well, you need something in between, even if you just, you know, every few months do a demo, you know, at least, I mean, I'm not saying that's truly agile, but it's certainly taking some of the agile ideas. There's a question up there. Uh, yes. Um, how can you reconcile constructively your intent with this process with an ACAT-1 major milestone decision process, which is pretty darn prescriptive, some of it even coded on, by congressional level and directive? Well, the thing is, in fact, we're working on, on a program right now where, where the uh, major milestones are, are, are hard-coded. You know, I mean, there's like a, there's requirements, and there's uh, integration, and there's delivery, and there's testing. But where we have the agility is in the, in the development area in order to get to those requirements. And in fact, that just, you, you know, I mean, what you're talking about is all the, all the review cycles, but we still have the review cycles, but they're not within the agile process. That's that's what I said was was uh, well, make it nicely say silly to do that. Uh, you know that's that's the purpose of the agile process is to sort of leave them alone. But what the output of that is, you can combine the output of a couple of agile teams and then do the testing and integration as part of your standard you know process and still be able to achieve better solutions 
and, and it might mean that you know all the requirements weren't weren't implemented. But then that's something that yeah you'll have to adjust to. But it still doesn't mean you don't have the process in place. So that's sort of a piggyback. My question actually was some of the confusion lies within um, government gets confused. I use the government here because they're the ones who put out these RFPs. The government gets confused initially because they're told, you know, the best way to do this is through Agile. So they say, okay, we want Agile development. And then they go out and they say, okay, well, how do you write a statement of work or a statement of objectives or a statement of requirements that are contractually binding to the contractor and put out an RFP and then expect to get a product back that you actually bid in the first place, that you actually put out the RFP for. So that so the the the, the main issue is is the education of the sort of the, the higher level right. acquisition workforce who's putting together these documentation these documents yeah. for the government and they still have to, oh by the way, be FAR compliant or DFAR compliant. And they have to have, so there's a there's a there's a sort of a chasm between the guy on the ground and the mission area who really likes agile software development, who says that really worked the last time, let's use it this time. And then he goes to the acquisition organization and says I want Agile, and then I, they can't write the documents so that well, they actually meet the requirement. And then so when the, they they award the contract, there's just spins and well, spins well, and well, spins, and they just keep spinning until they right. Spin but, no but one more. of the but one of the ideas, like I said earlier, is you you write you have the contract writing to the, right to the high level uh, capabilities. You say I want a capability to go to the ATM and get some money out, and I uh, you know I want to do an air, get an airplane ticket. So that's a cap you know at the at the at the airport. So those are capabilities. Are they going to be met by the contract? Yes. But you didn't say, you know, that it, you needed to punch, punch this button or look at this screen or anything like that. So one of the ideas is to give them, give a higher level set of, of need statements. The other thing is, who's going to decide whether this is good, bad, or indifferent? Well, usually you have a test plan, and, and the test plan you know, the, the, uh, the, test, the tests are performed and the customer signs off on the test plan. Well, here you, you might have some more responsibility to the customer to say, not only we know that the, you meet these four requirements, are you happy? You know, now, I mean, that's a little bit bad on the contractor side <laughs> because the contractor side is going to say, well, how do I make them happy? So, you know, there's going to be some give and take, but I think in the end, what you're trying to deliver is more satisfaction to the customer for the same time and money uh, and hope they adjust it, you know. But they have to, they have to put out a competitive bid. Yeah. And how do you evaluate that based upon the acquisition package that the government puts together? And then, so when they when they send in their proposals, these various companies, they say, oh, we know Agile, we do this, we do that, and et cetera, et cetera. Well, but but the end state is they have to meet the requirements prescribed and the documents that were put right, out but, during the but bid. Like I said, and, those and, requirements don't have to be down to what color the screen is, those requirements that say, I need to get money out of the bank. And so they can come back with proposals on how to do that. And, uh, and of course, they need to come back with the, the skills that they have in their, in their staff. So I want to say one more thing. Um, we're looking at what we're going to do next. And we, we certainly looked at, you know, we have uh, system engineers uh, working with Agile team. And we're trying to develop systems that would work, work better and faster and quicker and whatever. But you know, the interesting thing is, you know, I've had a lot of experience in model-based system engineering, and it's like, wait, wait a minute now, where can we use model-based system engineering, you know, within agile and system engineering? We started looking around at that. Uh, actually, Jeff and I, Jeff Banks and I, have uh, started trying to come up with some ideas on that and write up some uh, abstracts. One of the issues we found was model-based system engineering doesn't have an ontology. It doesn't have a, 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 a methodology that stated what it is. I mean, everybody's, you know, most of the time when you look at model-based system engineering, it's what system L is, you know. Well, system L, is that really model-based system engineering? I think there's more to it. And system engineering, there should be an ontology. I mean, there's ontologies for system engineering you know, from different perspectives. And of course, agile system engineering, you know, we've got some ideas here. So what we're going to try to put together is some ontologies, try to combine them together into some pro 
some framework for the first step, and the next step we try to develop a process about it. Now there is a transformational um, engineering group that's uh, working out in California that's looking at uh, more than just system engineering. They're looking at um, all sorts of uh, all sorts of illities to apply to the system engineering task. So we think that uh, there needs to be some some work done in that area. So uh, we're going to see if we can work with the team that we had. You know, they're interested, and we're trying to look for some other people that could help out uh, and, and maybe provide some ideas how things could fit together. Thank you. Does everybody have their green ticket? Want to do our book drawing? Okay, we got one in the back there, Bob. Okay, before we do our book drawing, I want to thank Gundars very much for coming out tonight. Let's hear a round of applause, please. As we get the tickets dispersed, I just wanted to present to you uh, Orrin, uh, Orrin Gundars. So we're in the corner of my eye up in the booth. Our uh, certificate of appreciation. So, thank you. George is taking the picture. It's my my photographer. You come yeah, with your own photographer. photographer. Yes. <laughs> Man after my own heart. Does everyone have a ticket? All right. Oh, you need a ticket? Two tickets. Mm -hmm. Paul was in the uh, dining room, wasn't he? Yeah, like Three or four announcements about that ticket. <laughs> the whole process. Was it a <laughs> So while we get those tickets, uh, Gundars, this is our new coffee mug. Oh, yeah. The message is still the same. It's not actually a mug. It's a caffeine delivery system. But our new mugs are also adorned with our 20th anniversary logo. And, and they are dishwasher friendly now. And they are only $15. And if you want one, see Alex Pavlak. They are a really great shape, too. They have that curve in them. I like the color. Last call on the tickets. The door prize tonight is Agile Software Development with Scrum by Ken Schwaber and Mike Beetle. Yeah, and like I said before, these are the when you talk about agile, uh, the agile uh, agile manifesto. They were the original authors of that, and and that's where if you read that book, you sort of understand where they're coming from, and and you get a little bit of understanding of why they're saying some things that make a little bit of, don't make a lot of sense until you read and find out how they did it and what environment they did it. And to illustrate that on the cover. Um, if you look at this book, don't worry, you aren't colorblind. Red is spelled R-E-D, but it's colored blue. Here we go for the drawing. Everyone get your tickets out. We got a ticket. We got a winner here, I think. So, oh, we're going to shake this for a good one. The suspense is. The suspense is. Let's see here. Two, two, four, nine, zero, one. Zero one, winner. Uh. We need a book report. Let's move over here. To get the I think you're in trouble. It's really small print. So. Move over here, sir. Okay. Joy, thank yeah. you. You have 20 days. <laughs> 20 days. All right, everyone. Thanks again for coming out, and um, be here next month.